It is my pleasure to introduce to you the chair of the session, Professor Howard Griffiths. Professor Griffiths researches physiological ecology in the Department of Plant Sciences here at the University of Cambridge. He is especially knowledgeable in future resource limitations arising from a growing global population in the context of food security. He is an expert in leveraging plant ecology to mitigate concerns in this area. Please join me in welcoming Professor Griffiths. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming back after the break. And uh, I'd like, first of all, to introduce my, my uh, amazing panel that I have here. I have David, David Nicholson from Bayer. We have Mark Tester from Kaust and Michael Koch from Syngenta. So we've got a good mixture of academic and commercial interests. Now, I want to start off by, first of all, I'm going to warn you that you're right. I noticed towards the end of the last session, there were a lot of people turning to their pads, their phones, and their, their, their laptops and so on. You want to be engaged in this session because we're only going to give short presentations and then we want you to ask us questions. But I'm going to ask you a question first of all. How many of you historically have thought plants pretty boring? Right? Plants? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, well, no, no, thank you for being frank because what we need to do in this next session is to convince you that you need to both be informed about plants and their role in plant productivity. You need to be informed about plants in the way that they are already helping to stall carbon, uh, climate change issues by sequestering two-thirds of anthropogenic carbon emissions at the moment. One-third going into the oceans, one-third going into, into forests on, on terrestrial forests. And so if we wish to maintain and sustain crop production in the future, Getting the balance between available land, which can be, uh, can be turned into high-intensive production in the face of these climate change issues, whilst protecting forests and also protecting oceans are really important key issues. And so what I'm, what I'm really pleased to be able to do is to introduce my guests who are going to give us from the outset their their view on their take on these particular issues. And then, after these short presentations, we want you to ask us questions, things that concern you, or things that you think are concerned in the general literature. And my colleagues here are going to start to provoke you, I hope, into those questions. So first of all, first up, who's going, you, Mark, you're going first. I can, if you would like. Sure. Yeah, Mark, you go first. I think that was the plan. We did have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Formulated one minute ago and already forgotten. No, no, hey, very well organised. We've got to be very creative and constructive here, and it's great to um, have the opportunity to hear questions from you and have some good discussions. This is important, and it's great that you've been frank and, and thinking that plants aren't that interesting, and, of course, all of you who did put your hands up are fundamentally wrong. Howard's already <laughs> given the, the first indication of how plants are important in terms of um, helping mitigate climate change, which is probably the most important issue globally at the moment. But we've also all need to eat, and we all need to ensure that our fellow members on this planet are fed and fed sustainably. And over the last 50 years, we've been producing about 32 million tonnes more of grain on average every year. Click, 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 like clockwork. It's been incredible. And yet, if we're going to meet all of the um, predictions for required food production over the next 50 years, we have to increase our annual increase of food production. You still with me? Howard said you've got to be awake. You've got to increase that annual increase by over 40%. So, and over that last 50 years, there's been all sorts of incredible innovations, not just uh, clearing of rainforests that Howard studies and draining of swamps that I used to study, but um, also increases in, in plant genetics. We've had amazing radical changes, and yet we now need to do more and we need to do 40% more than we've been doing over the last 40, 50 years for the next 40 or 50 years. So the challenge is really enormous. And I have great optimism that we will address this challenge, but to do it, we have to have innovation, radical innovation. We, we need to have innovation from the plant sciences. We need to have innovation in crop breeding. And we need to have innovation in the delivery of the advances in plant sciences and crop breeding to the farmers and food producers of the world. And so those types of innovations are manifold. They can be things which 
Actually, one of the most important things, I think, isn't even in my area. It's to do with weather prediction and being able to predict to farmers what the rainfall and temperature pattern is most likely to be over the coming season so then they can select the right varieties for the coming season. These things are going to happen. We're also going to have innovations, of course, in the... In, in, the, in the way breeders behave and act. And this, again, is already happening. For the moment, we've got incredible advances in genomics and our ability to sequence genomes. We talk about the $100 genome for the human health area. Was that talked about in the last session? Should have been. Um, and in plant sciences, we've got those same types of tools coming on board. So we've got the ability now to use the whole of genomics to turbocharge genomics, genetics, and crop breeding. So that's happening in the real commercial world. And then, of course, we need to be able to have innovations in deliveries of technologies. It's all very well for Professor Griffiths to sit in the posh University of Cambridge and do great work, <laughs> but that's no use for global food production if, and he does do it, so it's all right, <laughs> if people like all of us and all of you go out and deliver those advances to the people who matter, both in developed countries and in developing countries. And of course, we've got all sorts of fabulous technological innovations for that as well. Of course, I'm talking about the internet and communications technologies. Mobile phones are transforming Africa in front of our eyes. And those things are being adopted as well by farmers, so they can know about new varieties, they know about new agronomic techniques, and they know more about markets and what type of markets and prices they should be getting for their grains and their cattle and so on. So we've got lots of opportunities for innovation. GM is one that I haven't mentioned that I suspect we should be mentioning. GM is one of the innovations. And I take slight issue with the blurb you've got in front of you because you were talking about how we should be discussing how crop technology can solve further food challenges. Nothing, no single thing is going to solve anything, but we do use crop technologies and all sorts of technologies to address, at least have a good go at trying to address these challenges of crop production. And GM is one of the tools that we can deploy for trying to address challenges, big challenges that we've got out there in food um, production and delivering more crops for all of us. We've got to do all of this sustainably and in the teeth of climate change. Massive accelerating global climate change. So I'm not quite sure how you want me to conclude. Maybe there's just, just a few things to just throw out. <laughs> and, um... <laughs> it's very difficult to get him to stop at the best of times normally. But, uh... <laughs> and I look forward to your questions. Sure. Thank you very much, Mark. David, would you like to... Uh... Yeah, sure. I've got, a, I've got a few, four slides to share with you guys. Um, oh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank the organisers for inviting me along. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. You know, I uh, really want to echo the comments of some previous speakers, you know, how, how important it is for people like me to interact with the, the next generation of scientists, but also how much fun it is for people like me to interact with the next generation of scientists. You know, this, this, is, uh, this is a great event. I'm enjoying it, and I hope you guys are too. Um, now, look, I worked in the, in the pharmaceutical industry in R&D for for 20, 24, 25 years um, in, ve in various positions. I'm a pharmacologist by training. And I actually moved into to crop science just two years ago. Um, like uh, everybody, I made many mistakes in my career. One of the mistakes I made was not to move into crop science much earlier, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great area to be. Uh, and I want to spend a few minutes explaining to you why I'm enjoying myself so much working in R&D in crop science. Uh, just one slide about Bayer. Um, Bayer Crop Science, we're a big company, 22,000 employees. Uh, we have a turnover of about 9 billion euros, and we have about 4,500 employees in R&D. We spend about 900 million euros a year on R&D. In comparison to pharma, the crop science industry is relatively consolidated. There are just six big players, um, two of which are on the, uh, on the panel today. One slide on uh, some of the global trends in agriculture, if I can keep the connection here. This fits very much with some of the remarks that you heard uh, Sir David make uh, earlier on. Uh, population growth, changing consumption patterns, hunger, insufficient storage, climate change, 
do we have enough acreage to grow the food that we need to grow? Huh? Just a reminder of some of the things that Sir David talked about, but now bringing it down to an ag and agricultural crop science view, small part of what he was talking about earlier this morning. So in order to meet those demands, we need a revolution in agriculture to sustainably increase our productivity. We need loads of innovation. We need to enable farmers, big and small. We need to drive an intensification of agriculture. We need to extend partnerships. Companies like BioCropScience need to be part of a bigger ecosystem. <laughs> An ecosystem. You've all got big oh, egos yeah. or not? Oh, yeah. An ecosystem. You just talked after me, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An ecosystem with, with uh, insurance companies, with finance companies, with, with the John Deere's of this world, uh, with, with all the people involved in agriculture. IT companies, more and more involving IT yeah. companies in the need for, for agriculture, eh? partnerships. Okay. And now a slide to describe how we think about R&D at uh, BioCropScience, eh? to hopefully to trigger a lot of questions. Um, a few years ago, I think it's fair to say that particularly when you were talking about agrochemicals, you were talking about spray and pray. You'd have a chemical, you'd spray it onto your insect, did it kill the insect? You'd spray it onto the fungicide, did it kill the fungicide? And if it did, you were off to the races, you were three quarters of the way to having a product. Life is not like that anymore. We need effective, selective, environmentally friendly agrochemicals. We need to think more and more about using microbes, uh, modulating the microbiome around plants, to come with new products. We need to think about how we can modulate plant genetic material, either through transgenic approaches, GM approaches, or by using native trait approaches to enhance particular traits. And we need to bring all of that together. We need to use all the sorts of modern biology that healthcare companies have been using for many years. Healthcare companies spend billions you could say wasted billions to get to where they are today. Crop science companies have, are in this beautiful position of not wasting all those billions, of taking the learnings from human healthcare companies and applying the right technologies in crop science of modern biology. To understand how to go from genotype to phenotype, you can't do the breeding in people. You can do the breeding in plants. If you want to understand what the relationship is between genotype and phenotype, you can do it. You can do it in the greenhouse, you can do it in the field. It's beautiful stuff. To pick another point on this slide, digital farming. Huh? Farmers these days want to run their farm from their, from their iPads. They, and they do it. In Brazil, you go to farms in Brazil and you fly for 20 minutes over somebody's farm. That's the size of farms in Brazil. These guys manage it from their iPad. And they want to know, using satellite imagery, when to seed, how dense to seed, uh, when to use fungicides, when to use herbicides. They want guaranteed yields. They want systems which will give them guaranteed yields. So they need to know what genetics to use and what chemicals to use and when to use them. You can talk a lot about that. Computational life science, huge in crop science. Um, we talked about that in human health. Big and developing in crop science. You need to use breeding small molecules, biologic traits to give you the new products. You need to look at yield. We need to understand stress. We need to understand resistance development. We get resistance development in cancer drugs. It's exactly the same issue in fungicides or in herbicides or insecticides. We have exactly the same problems which you need to understand. And we need selective and safe chemicals. Beautiful world to be in. We need venture capital involved. We need small companies involved. We need more startups. We need startups feeding into the big companies. You guys, starting your career, you should really think about crop science. OK, thanks. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, David. I'm sure when uh, Sir David was speaking in the morning, your amygdala was firing like hell, because the challenge he was laying out with the climate change for the future is really a serious one. It's not only the change of the climate, it's also how do we deal with the growing population. We are growing by 200,000 people per day. How are we going to feed them? 
and you want to make them even more older. We are losing land every day. Per second, we are losing the size of a football field. Every second. Every second. Many of the varieties we are growing today are already failing in their performance based on climate change. A centigrade in climate change is dropping um, agriculture efficiently tremendously. Now, when you hear that, you can say, oh, we have to make sacrifices. And you heard in the morning, stop driving your Ferrari, stop eating meat, turn down your heating system because it's not sustainable. Well, as inventors, maybe we need to look on it also from another perspective. How can we use innovation? How can we use inventions to solve the problems? Can we make trees grow 10 times faster as they grow today and use them as a carbon sink? Can we produce meat without producing animals? 15,000 liters of water and the land use associated with the current system of meat production is certainly not, not sustainable. Where is the innovation potential? So as David was saying, indeed, being in the green sector, in the agricultural sector today, is a great place to be. We have many challenges, but we have also access to so much technologies to deliver the solutions. And the solution in genetics, in chemistry, in biologicals, in big data, how to see the climate change happening and how it affects your agriculture performance, how you can shift around varieties on a global scheme if climate is changing, will be one of the big contributions to the solutions of the future. Many, many challenges. What is required as a legal framework to make them happen? Well, we talked about the regulatory framework in the pharmaceutical area earlier this week. Um, the same framework is also hampering innovation process in agriculture. Europe is still technology hostile. We are giving away freely a genetically modified technology instead of having the right to know and to, to give choices to farmers, right? Our agricultural performance in Europe is 30, 40% lower than in the South Americas or in, in the United States. How long can that continue? The other part of the coin is what do we need as an infrastructure to drive innovations? And I'm talking here about the IP system. Who here believes that plants should be patented or patentable? Raise your hand. Uh, well, maybe 10%. Who believes that plants should be open source and freely available? Oh, okay, it's a majority. And uh, I think both sides are right. On one hand, you need to understand that building one of these modern plants takes 10, 12 years and costs you 150 million upfront. And it brings high tech in an easy to copy form to the market. Every farmer, every mom and pop can copy and propagate it in the backyard. Do you think anybody would make that investment without having some kind of IP protection? But then on the other hand, the open source argument is also correct. A plant is different than a drug, right? A plant needs to combine many technologies, many innovations. You need to have resistance against abiotic stress, biotic stress. You need to combine, for instance, 10, nine alleles to build an abiotic stress resistance. Right? You want to have nutritional value, and nobody, not even Monsanto, has the access to the entire technology. So, how do we preserve the good of both? Right? We want to have an incentive for innovation, for investment in this technology, but we need to also open the system in a way that it allows inventors, breeders to improve and to continue to innovate and integrate technologies and solutions. Otherwise, we will fail in the system. Right? And if you look on today's society, which is moving more and more into an open society, which has open integration, uh, open innovation, open collaboration, does the old IP system based on monopolies and exclude others still works? It feels like a relic, especially in areas of complex technology like plant genetics and plant engineering. So what do we do about that? Right? If the environment is changing, and that is basics in, in evolution theory, it's not the strongest who survives or the most intelligent, but the one who is most uh, adaptable to change. So here, I think it's a call to the users of the IP system, the owners of the IP system, if they want, um, like companies like Bayer or Syngenta or Monsanto, but also you, if you tr establish patents during your work. How do we use these patents? In the end, 
the IP system, the patent system, is a tool, a tool provided by society. And it's not the tool which is bad or good. It's how you use the tool. Right? You can use a hammer to build, make something constructive, or you can use it in a destructive way to beat somebody up. And the same kind of use is driving the perception of the patent system. So the dilemma we have is how do we change the perception of the use? And I think one fundamental area is how to become more open. Right? And um, together with some other parties, we also including colleagues from Bayer, we have started building, for instance, an industry licensing platform or an, a, an international licensing platform. It's like the iTunes. We want to make these technologies available freely for R&D, but also under clear conditions available for commercial use. And it has some very unique elements in it how you define price. You give your own power to define the price out of hand and you let it decide by an arbitration panel. Uh, that is quite groundbreaking in that area and has never done before. But I believe these are the ideas we need to find to preserve both the incentive for future innovation, but also getting away with the negative impacts of blocking technology evolution. So tells you also that innovation in this area is necessary, but not sufficient to solve the problems. There's also a lot of behavioral changes we need to use in industry, but also in science and academia, but eventually also in the legislative framework to make that change happen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Brilliant. Well done, everybody. Thank you. Okay, so we've had a lot of really challenging ideas and thoughts that have come out of our, our speakers. Um, we were also tasked at some point from, to mention biomass and biomass production systems. That can also be included in, in the pot. But I actually think that we've got a, a really good mechanistic framework that should allow you to get some ideas about que fundamental science questions you might wish to ask. And then also I can already see arms coming up because you want to ask about some of the issues that our speakers have raised. So that's really good, uh, and we should start off. Who's, who's going to go for I think the gentleman at the back, in the, right in the middle. Yep. He was uh, first out of the, first out of the, uh, blocks. the blocks, as it were. Hi. My name is Abhishek. Uh, I study in US, but I'm basically from India. And I'm from a region where there are maximum farmers to side. So between my master's and PhD, I spent some time with the families of those farmers and wanted to know what exactly went wrong. So here is a story. So Monsanto introduced this uh, cotton crop called BT cotton in India, uh, that region of India. And uh, uh, they say, like, uh, if you grow this crop, your production will be tripled. Uh, so what farmers do is, like, uh, they, they got a loan from a bank, um, and they use uh, one-third of that amount. Uh, they use the, some of that amount to grow one-third of the crops in their farm. So they say, my, my production will be three times, so I will be even. And they use the rest of the money to uh, marry off their daughter and everything. But Monsanto didn't give, give them the information that uh, this also requires a lot of agriculture technology, for example, irrigation. And that part of India is very dry. So what ended up happening is like, instead of tripling their production, they, uh, be, they went into loss. And th then the bank is on their head that uh, you, you mortgage your agricultural land and now we want, we want that back. Okay, I have every, every sympathy from a, from a personal perspective, but I think we should try and address this from a rather more generic issue, which is exactly. the, so, so which the point, is again... Point, point, is, point is that, uh, so the, while, while introducing such GM crops, uh, don't you think like, uh, there should also be the information available to the, sure. to the uh, local farmers, like how to implement that? Because the, uh, like the, the, the bad side of it, this is like the Monsanto or the G GM technology is, uh, getting uh, bad reputation in this thing. So, yeah, well, Michael, you I, look I cannot, like I cannot agree more. I think the entire agricultural um, landscape is about bringing solutions to farmers and not selling products, and that is true um, both for seeds but also for crop protection chemistry. Um, in the end, especially when we go into these emerging markets, I think we cannot expect that the farmers can be the smart integrators as they are in the developed countries. They are most likely overwhelmed by the technology and cannot get the best out of that. Um, and indeed, so here education and knowledge transfer is absolutely crucial and, and a real important point. I think the, um, the, the issue around the suicides in India is more complicated if you go into the details. It has also to do how you can get rid of your loans and your debts in India by committing a suicide. So it's a complicated societal banking issue. 
And indeed also here I think we, um, regarding how we capture value in these markets, the industry needs to make a step change, right? Stepping away from charging for inputs in participating, doing benefit sharing on the outputs. If a farmer indeed has three times, four times the harvest in the end, right? He has no problem giving you 10% of the value. And that change is happening, right? It's not fully implemented, but um, both the industry, but also the farmer society is understanding that these kind of, of systems need to change. It's just very briefly that system in Australia has already been fully yeah. rolled out for wheat. It's called Endpoint Royalties. Yeah. It's been spectacularly successful. Yeah. Works also in, in Africa. I think it's something the, the industry is really moving in quite, quite broadly. I, I understand the point you're making, and, and obviously this, it, we can't start talking about Monsanto or individual companies at a venue like this. Um, but what is clear, and I do believe that companies now realize this, is that you can't follow the same um, marketing sales practices in countries like India as you do in, in more developed countries. And if you do look at the, the practices that companies are now following in India, where whole villages are supported by individual companies and are educated. I, I think times have truly moved on from the, um, from the uh, case that you just described. And, and companies will be moving more and more in that direction. Okay, so I think we can hear, we hear that lessons have been learned and in recognition of the challenges ahead, there is gonna be a completely different way of rolling out this, these sorts of technologies. Okay, in the lady in the middle with the, uh, yeah, there, you, go on. Wait for the microphone to come so everybody can hear you. Inspired by your fascinating talks, I have two vegetarian uh, questions. The first one is about the vegetable we normally see in the supermarket. For example, the red peppers. Um, I just found it can be kept for a long time at the room temperature. And uh, me and my classmates ever tested it can up to one month without any change of either the quality of the color. So my first question would be, what's wrong with these peppers? Is it secure? <laughs> the, second, the second question is, is a general one. Uh, what, uh, what is the current or the future strategy you may think that can change, turn the desert into the Greenland? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, you. Well, well, Mark, we'll, ha we'll let Mark, because uh, he's good on gardener's question time as well. He knows, <laughs> he knows all about peppers, but he also happens to be working in a very arid, or well, has been working in arid environments. Mm -hmm. Mark. Do the second question first. Whichever one you'd like to do, yeah. Um, well, I don't know what's wrong with those capsicums, but I love the way you're thinking, and it was a lovely question. <laughs> I can answer the one with the capsicums. Yeah, so okay, can I. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, very so good. Can I. <laughs> Um, so to do the desert agriculture question, um, for, for me to talk about uh, getting the desert to green and, and, and be productive, we, at KALST we have a very large and um, aspirational program which covers um, several different research groups and areas, research centres in the university where the aspiration is to have solar-powered partial desalination of low-quality water, whether that's seawater, that would be ultimate, but groundwater which cannot be currently used, and you have solar-powered partial desalination of substandard water, and you irrigate crops that have enhanced salinity tolerance. And if you're able to put those three components together, the aim is to have a sustainable, like a truly sustainable um, agricultural system where you're unable to have any agriculture at the moment. So I'm the salt tolerant crops part of the equation and there's amazing new desalination technologies. There's several different types of new desalination technologies. If some of those can be altered, so instead of fully desalinizing, which is a bit of a waste, you actually partially desalinize and you end up with that leading to a reduction in the cost of the production and the energy consumption of that partially desalinized seawater. And if we can get the salt tolerant crops to be increasingly salt tolerant, we might be able to meet, the aspiration is to meet in a sustainable, economically viable middle ground where we're able to roll out, like truly roll out, a new type of agriculture. 
So that for me, and that's why I am where I am in Saudi Arabia, because they've got a combination of both the desire to develop this new agricultural system and the means with which to develop that agricultural system. That's what we're doing. And I think the important point to note there was the, the emphasis on the, the solar-powered desalination systems rather than fossil fuel. Could one of you just tackle yeah. very briefly the, the red pepper question? So, the, <laughs> so part of the answer to the red pepper question yeah. is, is, is probably something like this. So um, as, a, as a bit of background, um, companies like Bayer launch about 40 new vegetable varieties every year, and other companies actually launch many more than that. So there's many new vegetable varieties being launched each year, which are bred for certain, for certain attributes. Um, vegetables are not GM, it's, it's natural breeding. Vegetables are also treated by certain agrochemicals, huh? fungicides, pesticides in general. These agrochemicals are used under very tight regulatory controls in terms of the minimal residue limits that are allowed at the time of harvesting. But there are some fungicides out there, for instance, which inhibit respiration in, in cells through, for instance, succinate dehydrogenase, which have a beneficial effect on vegetables on shelf life in the supermarket. And obviously, this is a highly desirable attribute of these products for the supermarkets. So you can affect shelf life. Yeah. OK, there we are. OK, um, wow. where should we go next? We'll have a qu one in the front here. You wait for the microphone to come. Um, um, thank you very much for the nice introduction to the topic. I, I need to admit I was one of the people that a couple of years ago found the, the plant technology or anything regarding plants very boring. But now when I, when I moved in a different direction, moved out from the lab to more, um, I would say, business perspective, I see different opportunities. Um, and uh, my question for you as a representative of some companies as well is uh, it's about communication. Because you, met, you said you need innovation. Well, we need innovation. We as a planet, we need innovation within, the, within this area. So if you want to innovate, you need talent. But also, you have to certain reputation. It's not as bad as the reputation of the big pharma companies as we discussed yesterday. Um, but you have the GM mark on you, on your name, and and you'll be always associated with the GM food and the evil, and especially in Europe, uh, you'll be always the bad guys. Um, so I would like to know how you disassociate yourself uh, from the GM history or from the GM. Um, Mark, well, it's not history, I'd say, from the, G yes, from the GM, Mark, as well. GM is a tool, and you might use it, and it's, well, it's my personal opinion, it's not bad, it, we can actually benefit from that, but it's not that obvious for our global population. So how, he, how do you handle that? Well, who, who, like, I can start. Uh, I, I don't think the question is how we dissociate us from GM, it's more how do we change the perception of technology, especially in Europe, right? I think um, I mentioned the, the yield challenge we have in Europe and what we are really importing. Um, on long term, that becomes an ethical question, right? We have the buying power because we only pay whatever 10, 20 percent of our salary on food. Other countries don't have the same buying power. So I think there is a need for us to change the perception of technology, GM and breeding um, quite, quite broadly. I think Mark was bringing in an article on the sun which is quite positive actually in this morning and I was saying, well, is that because it's fool's day today that they are making a positive <laughs> article on, on, GM, on GM food. Um, no, but actually I think you see the tide slowly changing, right? People, especially in the UK, becoming, I wouldn't say positive, but more neutral regarding the use of, of biotechnology. And actually, when you look into um, how breeding works today, uh, breeding today uses a lot of biotechnology, marker-assisted breeding, uh, protoplast fusion, uh, MU rescue, double haploid technology. This is hardcore biotechnology, right? And still we have this perception that if a scientist, by using genetic modification, knows what he is doing, it's evil. And if you use traditional breeding and random mutagenesis, oh, that's good, because I don't know it's the hand of God who is doing that, right? Which is, which is really weird. Random ingredient, right? Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really weird. And it's, it's, I would say, pseudo-religious, right, to a certain degree. So I think we need to, we need to overcome that. Um, the problem we are facing, it's really difficult to get good plant geneticists and breeders. 
Um, at the beginning, in the, in the 80s, people were moving from uh, plant genetics to GM, to biotechnology. Well, this battle, now nobody in Europe tries to do it because people perceive that as a dead-end road and nobody wants to study that anymore. But we have really lost, uh, lost the potential of good breeders and good geneticists. That's a big problem for, um, for R&D in, in Europe in the future. Are you going to... Uh, do, do, can I ask the audience, does the audience have a problem with using GM technology in food or feed? Do you understand, do, so first of all, do people understand the difference between using GM technology in feed and GM technology in food? Do people understand that difference? No. So, no. So okay. We're talking, well, we're talking here about, uh, say, taking a, a GM crop of uh, corn, processing that into some sort of animal food stuck or corn syrup that you probably have in some fizzy drink or other, um, but you didn't really realize it, versus a genetically uh, an enhanced change gene which is directly in the food that you consume directly. Yeah. And do people have problems using GM technology for feed or food? So should we, should we just say f problems for feed, first of all? Anybody? anybody? So th those in favor of using GM for feed, let's go for that, yeah? Okay, and those in favor of GM for food? Okay. Okay, Okay. thanks. This is massively reassuring, eh? yeah. because if, if an audience like this didn't get it and support it, we'd really be in trouble. Because for me, you know, it's about education. It's explaining it. It's getting the, explaining to people in ways that people understand it. Talking to kids, talking to friends, talking to family, spreading the gospel, explaining that this is safe and it's a good thing. I mean, it is, it is the case that when I ask similar questions of my first-year students here, I get about the same response, and, and most of you don't really have a problem. But we have, what well, the problem we have in the UK, and for the, I realise many of you are not from the UK, but the problem in the UK, we've got the, the most bizarre um, uh, agreement between sort of what one might think poles apart, people whose views are poles apart politically, and some of whom have very entrenched, almost fundamentalist views about the rights and wrongs of these issues. And I hope that uh, we can maybe explore some of that. Mark, do you just briefly want to show your it's article? Just, uh... <laughs> no, you have to turn it around to yeah. show them. So, very august journal. <laughs> this is the first time I bought one of these in my life today. I was embarrassed. I went into the <laughs> WH Smiths with my... <laughs> one of these, please. <laughs> and there's a two-page article um, which I was involved in writing um, for The Sun because of exactly what you've just said. You've got to get out there and educate. And I've been doing this for a decade. And in a way, although I agree with you, and I do talk to some, even Sun journalists, I mean... No, but that, that's um, the level of... And you do that. And, but what's great about this is that, I mean, they, don't, they partially shape opinion, but they also reflect opinion. So for me, that's a symptom that not just in this room of educated... Um, technologically savvy people, we've got general support for GM, but in fact I think in the broader public there may well be a sea change going on in the UK and that's probably the credit of this government that's being more overtly sticking their head above the parapet and saying actually let's give it a go. But I mean for me I think a lot of business around acceptability of GM is also to do with the costs and the benefits and if for the rich West where you're only spending 10% of your salary on food and food related items, um, having the food a bit cheaper or a bit cleaner or something, it's a minimal benefit. And yet there's, an, there's a risk, if only because it's a new technology, and so therefore I think opposition's perfectly natural. It's actually logical to be opposed to GM in the absence of any further knowledge. Yeah. The no benefit possible risk, let's oppose in it, why Europe. not? In Europe. Take the lady in white. In Europe, Europe. yeah. Oh, okay. <coughs> I've been trying for some time. Yes, my original question was exactly uh, in this line of discussions. Uh, you mentioned about regulations being a very hamper, hampering factor, but I see a lack of education and also ethical <coughs> reasons being also a major factor in like the widespread of use of crop sciences and the new and advances in it. Uh, and my question is, what is being done to educate the society, and what? should be done differently to better educate the society? Because I think there is like a huge lack of education about the benefits of crop sciences and what it will bring to the society in the long run. Well, let me turn the question around. What are you doing to educate the next generation? So are you going to primary and secondary school and talking about technology and trying to take away the, the natural fear maybe for technology? 
I think we cannot delegate education to a couple of multinationals or a couple of professors. I think it's our responsibility as scientists to educate our compatriots, right? The other people in society. I think we have much higher credibility. The problem in, um, in, in that messaging is really the credibility factor, right? If you see the credibility of an NGO in comparison to the credibility of a big company, it's just so far ahead that we can pull so much money into that it will never work, right? So that's, I think, where the alliances with the academics, with you, comes into play. And that, I think, is also something where we need to work together. And otherwise, we will not be able to make the change. OK. Uh, gentleman in the middle of the blue shirt, stripy shirt there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question was more general, so don't hesitate to push it back towards the end if you feel that it's uh, too early in the discussion. Um, so I noticed that your panel really uh, takes into account everything that was said during the keynote. Um, and so my question to you was, um, the panel just before on future health, to me it seemed that there was a huge gap between what they were talking about, and I don't know if any of the panelists of future health are still here, and the keynote of, of uh, Sir David King. And so um, I thought, I, I, it was my thinking that in all what they were uh, talking, there were, for example, at some point they mentioned climate change when it served their purpose. For example, uh, malaria is moving north by more malaria vaccines. Um, and so, um, and also trying, they, they were discussing on how to modify delivery of healthcare and saying that the delivery of healthcare has to be local but not taking into account something that is crucial in your technology is taking into account uh, the evolution of climate. And so um, I was wondering, what was your opinion on that? Um, you know, especially since there's two, um, two uh, persons who were working before in a pharmaceutical industry, um, how come some, some, uh, some um, domains in biotechnology completely ignore um, how would the future look maybe, um, while you in your industry have to absolutely take that into account? I, I think I could reply on their behalf, first of all, to say that I, I suspect that's pro that they probably hoped that such a narrow view would not have been projected during their, their talk. They were trying to highlight some areas that they felt were critical, that, which related closely to their research. Um, so, uh, and the second thing is, I would say, in defence, is that plant folk are kind of, well, we're, we're rooted in <laughs> reality. <laughs> it's just the way we are, because... You know, anybody who's trying to grow, grow plants, even in your own backyard, you know the, about the vagaries of having to... You, you're just aware of the environment and so on. Anyway, and David. Just <laughs> speak on behalf of the pharmaceutical industry. Well, I, Maybe, I work in a pharmaceutical company, yeah. so I... Was, so, yeah. yeah, so, okay. So, I, so then you know the answer to your question. I, I mean, I do... Th pharmaceutical companies are responding to many of the issues that uh, Sir David brought up, you know, the aging population, for instance, and, and pharmaceutical companies are increasingly focusing their R&D efforts on diseases of the elderly. Um, the problem is, it's really difficult <laughs> uh, to do that. Uh, um, and at the moment, pharmaceutical industry is, is moving more and more into, into oncology, because we're starting to understand that. You know, but so I was more meaning the adaptation of pharmaceutical industry to the future resources, because you know um, health is going to need also resources. How will you produce you know cheaper vaccines if polymers get increasingly expensive? Is if it gets increasingly harder to reach certain areas of the world? So it was more since this is the resource panel um, in that aspect. Do you have any comments? Well, I, I think in the end, it's, 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 it's a true dilemma, right? We need to find how we allocate our resources in, in the end. I think it's difficult to say what is more important. Is it uh, the food security and, um, or is it the health? I think you need to find the right balance for it. Um, in my view, we cannot afford to fail on food security. If this is going wrong, I think you, see, you, you will see people moving and you will see um, a social stability rising very, very fast. We cannot fail on this, not, not even coming close to it. I'm meant to be here talking about crop science, but you know, just thinking about your, your, your question, one, one of the big movements that is taking place, both in crop science as well as actually in the pharmaceutical industry, is a big move towards green chemistry, which maybe goes in the direction of your, of, of your, of your question, and, and trying to 
yeah, to use green chemistry, to use more synthetic biology to, to, produce, our, to produce our end products. So there is a lot of work going on in that direction. Yeah. I can, okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll try you, yeah, okay. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Alvaro from Uppsala, uh, Silabla. We sequence actually the spruce genome. So, uh, um, but this is more a personal question, which is in the back of my head since uh, this other technology that hasn't been uh, spoken that much is, uh, is taking mainstream, which is 3D printing. So what I wanted to ask the panel, how do you see a future where we print our food instead of cultivating it, and how that would change your industry. How are you prepared to adapt to that? And how close are we of that? Okay. Michael, you were. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch the asking about oh, we can, printing. We print our food. So we're going to print our food? Um, well, what about the burgers, the synthetic burgers? Well, I, I was thinking in the same direction. Yeah. Where I've yeah. seen this technology emerging is really in um, synthetic meat production. Right, and I, I think if you think 20 years ahead, um, that this could be something I can imagine, right? And it would change agriculture fundamentally if you think that 80% of agricultural production is going into animal and then into meat. I think that could really unleash a, a lot of potential, right? If um, it will not reduce it to zero, and I think there will be always a premium market for, for real meat, but it could solve some of the issues. Yeah, I think we'll be printing our meat in the next decade because um, it's, it's just the sums are actually are starting to add up. It's incredible. And this work's been driven in the Netherlands, and yeah. it's, it's superb work. Mm. Are, you, are you having any initiative with respect to the companies? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any ex-cancel department where you're really focusing? We have it on the radar screen. Let's say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> We're always looking for adjacencies huh? and got the feelers out mm -hmm. there. Okay. Yeah. Would you like to? Lady in the gr lady in grey in the middle, just in the especially after your here. question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm from Nigeria, um, and I know that um, African many African nations are currently embracing agricultural biotechnology, especially because of the perceived um, benefits um, to improve, you know, in improving uh, food security and possibly eradicating hunger and poverty. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that countries like Burkina Faso are now big in GM uh, crop production. Kenya and even Nigeria is currently doing field trials in, in about five crops. Um, so, but my, my concern about Africa is that sometimes um, it's very hard for them. They're usually hesitant at the beginning to embrace new technologies, but when they do, they go really, really fast without asking any questions. They rely on your expertise and trust you for the products that you are bringing into the market. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand your point that it's not your responsibility to provide education, maybe in a, at the secondary or tertiary level, but I think that it is also your responsibility, at least to some extent, to educate them because the thing about, at least I speak for Sub-Saharan Africa where um, education in biotechnology is still very poor, relatively new. Um, so uh, they don't have really that expertise to be able to provide that information that the public needs to understand what GM crops are all about. Um, so my thing is that when you offer your products or your technology, do you provide some level of education or information, at least to the governments that you're working directly with, to be able to now trickle down to the masses to understand what's going on? Just, you know, so they understand the benefits and as well the consequential effects, uh, potential effects to the end, end users or consumers. Yep. Absolutely. When it comes to um, especially biotechnology, uh, this is nothing you could just hand over without good stewardship. It's not possible because you need to breed it into some locally adapted varieties. It's not just giving a product or a variety which works in the US or in other countries and hand it over to people in, in Kenya or other countries. You need to work with local seed companies, with local um, breeding institutes. We are working with Kari in Kenya and, and, and other institutes to do the knowledge transfer, but also to make sure that these technology is handled in a responsible way and bred into the right varieties. Actually, the technology as such is useless unless you combine yep. it with the right genetic background. Um, and that is absolutely crucial. And that is, I think, also something which first needs to grow in these countries, right? Um, not just importing seed from other countries which have mediocre performance in, in Africa, but enabling a local breeding community 
right, which is a long-term story, needs to start with establishing plant breeders' rights, it's the right regulatory environment, it's a long-term strategy which is necessary. It's not a short-term shot. And, and maybe one quite brief remark. <coughs> Global companies have to have one stewardship quality standard applied globally, no doubt. We have to put, we have, we have one standard for the safety and efficacy of our products, which is applied globally. That is the only way, the only right way, the only proper way, and the only way that global companies can, can operate. Yeah. Practically. Okay, who's going there? In the middle, right in the middle, towards the two thirds of the way back. Lady with gray cardigan. Sorry? Oh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. I'm sort of looking. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, yeah. far away. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I will back to the GM problem. Um, as we've seen, most of the audience was very positive about having the, uh, of course, bigger uh, plants and so on, and uh, including me. But I wanted to ask about the issue of introducing the uh, herbicide resistant genes into the organisms. Uh, do we know much enough to be able to defend this issue in front of the public or is still much more research needed to know about the impact on the metabolism or taking over uh, the ecosystem by these organisms? Mm -hmm. Who would like to go with that? I can do it. Um, can do it? Well, I mean, for a start, herbicide resistance isn't a GM thing necessarily. You can get herbicide resistance through non-GM approaches. Secondly, no crops are weeds because um, they're utterly dependent, have been, become utterly dependent on humans for their propagation. And I guess the third thing is that you can get some transfer at very low frequencies into weeds, or you can get problems with weed volunteers. And farmers, if they're going to become a problem, the farmers will drop it like a hotcake, so these guys are on top of this, like anything, because it's in their interest to be so. And farmers, through agronomic practices and alternating use of herbicides, for example, or alternating use of crops with different resistances, that's what they do in the Australian systems, um, which are non-GM systems, I should say. Um, that this is manageable through agronomy and it's in everybody's interest to manage this for economic reasons, let alone for environmental reasons. And please understand from a regulatory perspective, the regulatory hurdles to get That's these it. crops <laughs> approved are very high. And, we, and crops are only launched when we meet those regulatory hurdles. It has to be managed when these crops are out there with, with herbicide resistance, but that's true of GM crops as well as non-GM. As well as non-GM. And that's down to good farming practice. Yes. And, and we really need to work on that. You know, herbicide rotation, rotation of crops. Farmers need still to manage their farms. And actually, and you guys are asking good questions of these guys about um, education. The, the companies are really good, actually, at helping farmers do this. They put out the information sheets and the fact sheets and advice. They're usually very good at that because it's in their interest to do that anyway. It's in everybody's interest. I think the question is either, well, um, do we understand uh, the long-term impact of herbicides per se? Because herbicides are used for ages, right? And the, the fact or herbicides which kill everything, like glyphosate, are relatively rare and difficult to come by. So most of the herbicides we have are selective. And they only should kill the weed, but not the crop, right? And so uh, this is a very natural phenomenon. So herbicide resistance is actually more a, a common theme. Right? And transferring these genes from the resistance crops into other crops can be done by other breeding or GM technology. The one area which I think we are at the industry and also as, as the farmer starting to learn how to manage the race of herbicide tolerance, right? the loss of the resistance. Um, and that is something which we, I think, need to manage more carefully using double motor action and more combinations and more mixtures to avoid these kind of issues because it could really affect the sustainability of the products. Okay, I'm going to go to one at the front because Professor Lowe's been waiting patiently. If we can, uh, do we have a, a microphone? And is he the big boss? <laughs> do you want me to share that? Oh, yeah. Well, I think there's one, there's one coming. Here we go. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is a question which arose out of some work I did with the Foreign Office a little while ago, and that was looking at uh, minerals and metals and so on that were actually in short supply on the planet. 
Uh, now, setting aside the obvious ones like the rare earth elements and copper and one or two other ones, the one that really surprised me most of all was phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Now, phosphorus is in real short supply worldwide. Uh, current rates of usage, if I remember my figures correctly, it was 35 years supply. Now, even with the recovery from waste and municipal waste that Dave King was talking about this morning at about 1%, I don't see how you're going to get your 40% uh, you know, compound aggregated per annum from now on, if that's so, hmm. without some other way. Now, my plant biochemistry is not as good as it used to be, but uh, we know that phosphorus is important for plants. So how do, how do you square that circle? Yeah, I mean, phosphate's the number three element, or number two or three element required um, as a nutrient. I don't think those numbers are correct. Um, well, saying so 30 years... No, I mean, no, I think the numbers I see are, are, are nearer the 100 years. And, and there's, there's always this peak oil or peak this and peak that. And, and I, I think it's all to do with the price of extraction and, and, and the incentives for going out and finding some more. So the American US well, Geological Survey went and did a survey in Iraq after their little skirmishes there and found huge um, new reserves of phosphate in the mountains in, in Iraq. And I think this is a classic supply-demand model where I think the mining companies are very responsive to the increases in, um, in prices and they'll get out and find more. It will be to do with price, not to do with actual availability. There's heaps of phosphate out there. No, it's, um, well, we can talk about this later. To me, I think there's, there's a lot, and I'm not just taking blind faith in the, in the dynamic responses of market forces and companies. I actually genuinely think there's heaps of these things out there. But still, breeders are working both on nitrogen but also phosphor use efficiency so that the plants can take that up more easy and can grow on less supplied uh, grounds which also would reduce the need for fertilizer application. So that is certainly something um, breeders are working on. And this is to do with costs of inputs. Yeah. So nitrogen's so expensive now that it's become viable for the big companies to invest a lot of money in improving the nitrogen use efficiency of their crops so then farmers don't have to spend a quarter of what they get out of their crop on just nitrogen yeah. fertiliser. Input costs but also environmental issues well, leakage into groundwater. Regulatory, yeah. Go on. yeah. And, and the fertiliser companies are starting because of this problem of, of the resource supply, are starting to look at recycling uh, phosphate. So the fertiliser companies are on to this. Okay. Uh, where do we go next? It, the gentleman in the blue, with the blue shirt there. Hi, thanks a lot for your discussion so far. Um, I was wondering, in 2007, there was a UN report um, saying that there's enough food for 12 billion people, and that basically suggested that rather than a productivity problem, we have a distribution problem. And I was just wondering what you guys uh, think of that. Well, well, of course, there's a distribution waste. problem, yeah. and there's, of course, there's a huge waste issue yeah. as well. And both of these have been around since time began, and yes, you keep doing this. I think we're just focusing on the ag biotech because this is a technology, we were asked to look at how technology can address food supply. And yeah, let's use technology to reduce waste, let's use technology to increase uh, distribution. I'm not so sure we can feed 12 billion. Yeah, that, that figure is new to me. The figures that I normally read about and see is that we've got, you know, whatever it is, seven and a half billion people on the world today. Um, for we, One billion uh, don't, do not have enough food of that seven and a half billion, and we waste food sufficient to cover that one billion. So you know, just to make the distribution problem, the waste problem sort of, you know, put it into figures. Yeah. It, it so there's a also, huge waste yeah. and distribution issue, but I, I don't think we can, we produce enough food to, 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 uh, to feed 12 billion at the moment. It depends but also how you define food security, and there are two different um, <laughs> definitions for it. The one is, what is the bare minimum that you don't die? And that's a 12 billion figure. The other is, how many people can you feed that they are also happy with what they get? And here the number is much lower. And okay, could just Thanks spike into one thing. We keep focusing, myself included, on yield and tonnage. And there's, a, there's arguably a much more important problem, which is to do with the quality yeah. of the food especially micronutrient compositions such as vitamin A, iron, zinc, and this is called the hidden hunger. Mm -hmm. So people yeah. go to food with 
go to bed, and I'm sort of saying what you are actually, you're going to bed with, with a full belly, but you still wake up in the morning feeling rubbish and you have to go and collect the water and you've got horrible lethargy. They mentioned it in the sun. <laughs> and this is, <laughs> so it must be true. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, they got it from me. That's true. But, uh, but, but uh, women in particular for women, that this is called the hidden hunger and it's, it's um, something we all need to keep in our brain as well. Okay, gentleman there just with a dark jacket. Sure. He's dealing with him. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to comment or ask a question on the comment Dr. Cock made earlier with uh, maintaining incentive for innovation whilst keeping plants open source. Um, so plants are self-replicating, um, just like what happened to music when the internet came about. And so basically that caused a whole lot of chaos, almost crashed the industry in some countries um, due to pirating. But then you changed their business model to be more subscription. Yeah. And so, could you not translate this to plant science? Because there's two, there's two issues with uh, with the Terminator technology. That's pretty controversial. Then, if you say if you can't, not, uh, having to have the farmer buy seed every season is also controversial. So, if if the farmer's allowed to keep the seed but pay a subscription to using that uh, intellectual property, there's incentive for innovation still, plus sure. a sense of open source. So you're obviously experts, you may have already thought of this, I just thought it was an interesting point of discussion. I think yeah. it's, it's uh, an important point. Yeah, a, absolutely. Point. I think and in, in, in several countries the system is moving in what you call subscription model, point of delivery model, which is allowing farmers to do farm safe seed if they want against a fair contribution in the end. So like a license or subscription fee. Um, Farmers are normally smart enough to understand when they should stop doing it. You can do farm safe seed maybe for two generations or three generations, then you get so many pathogens and uh, stuff into your seed that you better stop doing it, otherwise your yield drag is too high. The problem is uh, currently um, legislators are undermining the enforceability of the POD system, the point of delivery systems, especially in Europe where we have um, Supreme Court, uh, uh, Court of Justice ruling that you can't even get the information if farmers are doing farm safe seed. So legally, um, we have a system in place even in Europe, but it's not enforceable, and that's a big issue. And farmers, um, they still don't see the necessity for benefit sharing out of their own accountability to support the, the pipeline of um, of uh, yeah, innovation. So th I think we need to have a broader understanding with, with stakeholders in agriculture to bring these, these systems really to life. Yeah, just a quick comment about Terminator. There's a lot of fuss about it, but it's again like herbicide resistance. It's not a GM specific issue. And farmers have been buying seed from seed companies for 70, 80 years fresh because it's better quality seed. And in the maize market, where there's been the most phenomenal increases in yields, it's a huge success story. The maize breeding, that's all F1 hybrid. Yep. And they have to buy the seed from the farmers every year. It's been going on for 70 years, very successfully. Okay, thank you. Uh, where have we go? Gentleman in the, uh, yes, I spoke to you earlier from New Zealand, I believe, in the blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I get the impression that uh, most of the topic uh, is really about big volume farm crops. And I just like the kind of switch to a little bit more refined foods and uh, ask the question, of how the big multinationals that you represent uh, are interested in, you know, the breeding of superfruits, of foods that have much more bioactives that are tending to go towards preventative medicine, healthier lives, and reducing pharmaceutical costs. So I'm just trying to make the loop because I know, David, there is what both pharmaceutical and crop science, as you made the point. Um, so, companies are moving in this direction. Um, so, when in, in canola breeding, we are looking at um, oils which are rich in the you know, healthy oils, just to keep it simple. So, so we do have programs in that, as as do other companies. So, it, it is on our agenda. Um, in our vegetable breeding program, we do look at the, the quality of the fruits that we're producing. So it, it is there. You can sense I'm hesitating because I don't want to suggest that this is a large part of our 
of our efforts. It, it is not. Um, it is on our agenda from a strategic perspective um, to, to work out where to go in this direction in the future. You know, uh, personally, I'm very intrigued by companies like Nestle, who are investing massively in, in health sciences, and, and they're thinking very hard about the, the health benefits of their food. So I, I do think that in the, in the coming years, we will need to think more and more about that. You know, having said that, to make health claims is a big deal. You know, if you want to make a health claim for, the, for your food that you're going to reduce you know, cardiovascular events, uh, and you want it on your label, I don't know, in the States, then, then you've got to do 30,000 patient clinical outcome studies to prove that. So, you know, this, it sounds obvious that we should be doing this, but it is a huge investment um, to, to get there. So, we'll see how things move over the next, over the next few years. Maybe uh, uh, building briefly on that, yes, these kind of activities are already ongoing and products are on the market, especially in the vegetable area, but they are rarely branded for that, for, especially yeah. the reason David was mentioning. High vitamin C, green pepper really with 10 times vitamin C than a normal pepper. Um, broccoli, which is enriched of glucosinolates, which are known to suppress cancer. These kind of products are on the market already. Um, if the best example in this area, I think, would be golden rice, right? The vitamin E rich rice, and I think it's an absolutely shameful example how NGO activities can block beneficial products coming to the market and reducing really blindness of children in APEC. It's a humanitarian product and it's blocked deliberately. And the, the numbers of uh, blindness which has been caused by that kind of deprivation goes into the hundred thousand easily. So even if we have the solutions and the products, we often have as an industry, but also as an academic society, the problem to bring these products to the market. And I think this is something where we need to really get the alliance across the board to make that happen. Can, can I, I'm just going to use Chair's prerogative here, because one, one thing I'd like to get these guys to tease out on your behalf, and I was hoping that somebody would by now have asked a question. What about the issue with land grabbing, because, uh, and also the notion of smallholder smallholder farms where family farms are shared or divided and passed down the line, ever in decreasing in their area. And how do you get your technology, or is, it, is, there, is, there, is, there, is it worth getting your technology into smallholders? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in, in, in the, for instance, in the Indian market, dealing with smallholder farmers is a common scene, right? Farmers which have maybe two acres or something on land, and still they are growing crops with a lot of technology and getting a lot of the acreage. So there is not a contradiction. Size doesn't matter, right, regarding productivity. Okay, that's me putting my place. Right, another question. <laughs> you were only asking a question, you didn't make a statement. <laughs> <laughs> Go, the gentleman down in the blue shirt on that. Actually, I should just say very briefly, it's the UN International Year of the Family Farmer yeah. this year. Yeah. So I assume that's where you were coming from. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. One of is that so? Is that right? okay. uh, I think one of the most worrying and horrifying statistics is the amount of arable land that we have left. So I think someone mentioned about growing uh, crops in the desert or Antarctica. That's, I would imagine that was one of your goals. But firstly, what I would ask is if all of our dreams came true and we were able to grow crops in Antarctica and the desert. How many people would that land support? Firstly, I've got another one. But. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing, because we're trying to bring into production land, which is currently not in production. There's, there's heaps of land out there, but you can get less than one tonne per hectare of grain off it, so it's not really viable. So how much could these lands produce? Your crop potential is probably 16 tonnes per hectare, gentlemen, something like that. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so the global average is about two tonnes per hectare, so we've got quite a lot of opportunity for improvement by getting more out of the land that we've already got under production. Well, I think one of the things that I've not actually heard anybody spoke about, I'm an animal scientist, and if we are 
when you need using deserts or the Arctic plains uh, for crops, do you have any sort of biotech plans to actually conserve the species that are in that biome or in those biomes? So I, I suppose, well, briefly, I would, I would have thought that if, that if such areas were able to be brought into productivity, then the, the whole natural change in and migration would already have occurred because they would, their 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 natural their, in, in a way it'd be like what we're what we're going through that would be a scenario which would mimic the uh, retreat of the glaciers and the movement of forests and so on that we saw in, in since the last glaciation. But I don't think I don't I mean only through things like Millennium Sea Banks and so on are we going to conserve these things. The, the the question I think that you're touching on is one which we haven't mentioned, which is the other issue of land sparing and land sharing, which is also a focus of much interest at this, at this institute. Um, and there you have the notion that land which is currently under agriculture, intensively farmed, should be farmed more intensively, so that you can then spare additional lands nearby which may contain parts of your forests or your natural, and encourage through educating the locals to have an appreciation of the diversity and perhaps earn funds from, or money from tourism, ecotourism and so on. So I think there's a question for the future of getting the balance between any of, the, any of these new lands that may become available. And I think it's a long way off. I think that's really well said. Absolutely. You know, so I completely agree with everything you've just said. Uh, maybe a, a couple of small additional points. You know, there is, we talked about Africa earlier, there is arable land in Africa that, we're, that is not being utilised and that is something for, for the future. Um, and in, in terms of you know, protecting the environment, crop science companies want to protect the environment. We want to do that. You know, it's, and, and it's something that people like myself can get very emotional about. You know, that I think, people, I think uh, you mentioned that crop science companies have a slightly better reputation than pharma companies. I assure you, I assure you, it's, a, it's only slightly better. Yes. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Yes. And, and I can get very emotional about it. You know, crop science companies are full of people. Yeah, I did the same when I worked in pharma. You know, we're full of people who want to do what's right for for, for this earth, and you know, and we want to we want to develop products which um, you know which which conserve land. And, and I, you know, when we when we get uh, when we register our products, you know, so for instance, I was in Brazil. I was in Brazil. <laughs> Thanks. I was, it's only water, it's no use. Um, I was in Brazil recently. To get products registered in Brazil, you have to go to three agencies. You go to the Minister of Agriculture for does it work. You go to the Ministry of Health for is it safe to people. And you go to the Ministry of Environment for is it safe for the environment. And you only get products registered if you go through all of those three bodies. You know, so the regulations are in place and crop science companies want to meet those regulations. It's a heartwarming little moment from the agrochemical industry there. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Wipes tear from eye. Yeah. We have, we have a, we're moving into the end game. I see that the various screens are being flicked on and think people are getting a digital withdrawal symptom. So a couple of final questions. Lady in the middle there with the, the glasses. Thank you. I'm Jane from Imperial College London. So um, the lab uh, is focused on the treatment on biomass. So um, um, it's pre-treatment pre on the lignin. So lignin is not uh, is not that easy. I was wondering if you are thinking to increase the proportion of hemicellulose and cellulose when you designing the genome. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, one, one of the one of the beauties of plants is that a once formed. They tend to endure, and so one can either store carbon in them permanently, or one can try to move, as your research is interested in, it's something that we should just mention because we haven't actually touched on the biomass aspects of this, but it is one way that of uh, moving towards David King's notion of the circular system, whereby if we use bioenergy, use as energy carbon which has been fixed within the last annual or biennial cycle, last two or three years, we can close the loop to some degree. And so there is a huge interest in trying to either make lignin more 
degradable so that one can recover the glucose moieties that make up the cellulose fibrils that are also embedded in that lignin? Or alternatively, can we make crops which perhaps would be more easily digestible? And of course, the great question then is, will they, they tend fall to fall over? Yeah. <laughs> and so there's, there's, a, there's also a considerable amount of work being done on, on looking at closing that biomass loop and trying to turn that into a sustainable energy source, which is, of course, the, a, a sensible way to go forward rather than the current notions of using wheat or maize as bioethanol sources. Yeah, yeah. But we won't go there because we clearly yeah. all agree that that's just only, 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 only use at the moment because of the subsidies and so on. Yeah. One uh, lady there, yes. So my question, given that we have the slide up here talking about all of the basically technologies that you need in order to achieve all of the goals up top, and you're sitting in a room full of scientists, my question to you is, what are the top one or two challenges that you see a technology need for that potentially these scientists in this room could actually address? I think that's a great question to sort of finish the session on, and I'm going to go round the, the panel. So that's okay? Yeah. Michael. Um, how can you replace meat stepping away from animals? I think that would be groundbreaking, um, especially if it tastes like USDA certified beef in the end and not like a sponge. Um, which is today, unfortunately, the quality. That, I think, is one. And then, really, big data analysis. We have so much genetic potential in plants and varieties across the globe. How can we move them around to compensate for climate change? Big data, climate data analysis, not starting to breathe when the change is happening, but exploiting our current genetics in a much more smarter way, um, which is uh, going more into the IT technology and how we exploit genetics, understanding genetics and how we, how we use them in a better and more efficient way. Gosh, it's a great question. I'm not quite sure. My brain's spinning trying to think of really what would be number one. Um, for me, I have to say that um, because the interests of, of nature conservation and not cutting down more, destroying more natural, we have to increase the intensification of our agriculture. And for me, the only way to do this sustainably is to have sustainable irrigation. And so I think that we have to increase our irrigation in agriculture and to do this in ways that are absolutely sustainable. I guess the second thing I would do is, is address the hidden hunger. I think this is, if we can make one or two billion women wake up in the morning in developing countries more energised and can unlock the full potential of a massive fraction of the planet uh, by increasing uh, micronutrients, nutrition, iron, zinc, iodine, um, vitamin A, this would be a massive um, breakthrough. So that's what the two things I would do. Mm -hmm. It's always difficult to go last because much of what you say is not being going to us. Okay, so, um, so look, genotype to phenotype as, as a big topic. Um, the genotype is pretty easy. The precision phenotype is a, is a huge challenge at the moment. So to be able to properly phenotype, to phenotype the crops, to phenotype the weeds, to phenotype the pathogens that we, that we, that we wanted to get rid of, and to understand all of that. Precision phenotyping. Oh. That's, that's nice. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that keeps happening. Right, I would, I would say, so uh, speaking as somebody who is uh, privileged enough to be able to teach students who come through this institution, and speaking to you all, education, Education, education is the most important thing. The empowerment of women in so many societies, but all of you spread the word. And then the second thing is just a personal one, because my, myself and my colleagues in my department are involved in trying to enhance photosynthesis. And there are various plants, such as maize, which have what we call turbocharged photosynthesis. And this is proving... No, this is proving where the so-called C4 pathway, trying to put that into rice, for instance, or trying to put other concentrating mechanisms into higher plants to improve the operating efficiency of the, the enzymes. And that's interesting. That's interesting. Okay, that's a long, long way off. But the other thing that the message that I want you to get is that the fascination and interest and excitement that fundamental research engenders, which may at some point. 30 years down the road, bring something which will be useful for you all to use. But remember, encourage 
fundamental research as well as direct uh, as applied work. Thank you very much for your attention. And thanks to